all my life. All I know, God's been good, good to my soul. Mountain high, valley low, I'm gonna sing wherever I go. All my life, all I know, God's been good, good to my soul. Mountain high, valley low, I'm gonna sing wherever I go. God is for me, He's not against me. I will. Welcome to Olive Branch Baptist Church. What, what time is it? I, I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, as you probably know, uh, we were, my family and I were in England this past week. Last Saturday, we went to my nephew's wedding. And uh, yesterday, we had about 23 hours from door to door of traveling, three different time zones and a time change. So I don't know what time it is. The clock tells us it's right after 11 o'clock on Sunday morning, and so I'm glad that you are here at Olive Branch Baptist Church today to worship God and to give Him all the praise that is due His name. I also wanted to uh, explain, I didn't get to talk to many of you before the service because I was in Sunday school, uh, but uh, you may have passed and, and noticed my face is bruised and stitched, and so I wanted to explain that to all of you so I wouldn't have to tell each one of you a uh, hundred different times. Uh, I don't know which would you think would be uh, more of a distraction, uh, someone sitting at the table while the groom is giving his speech and coughing and coughing and coughing, or a body laying in the floor with, in a pool of blood. Uh, I think uh, you would think the first, and trying to avoid the first, I created the second. So that's what happened to me. I don't know if uh, you know this, but you can cough violently enough that you pass out. And that's what happened to me. Uh, my nephew was giving his speech, and I didn't want to cause a scene by sitting at the table and coughing and coughing and coughing. So I got up, walked halfway across the room, and fainted because I was coughing. And if you're standing when you faint, there's only one place to go, and that is straight to the concrete floor, face first. And so I had stitches and busted nose and teeth bashed in and... Uh, a bruise all over. So it's getting there. A week later, I look much better. Uh, 
I kind of wished it would improve my face somehow, but that doesn't seem to have happened. And I think in a few more weeks I'll look all right. But that's why I look a little strange today. But I am okay And after spending almost a day in the ER, getting checked out, no problems, just cuts and bruises. So I praise God that there's nothing worse and that we are here today. And I did want to read to you today from Psalm 60. I'll find when I turn it here. 67, Psalm 67. May God be gracious to us and bless us. May he make his face shine upon us so that you may, so that your way may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations rejoice and shout for joy. For you judge the peoples with fairness. And lead the nations on earth. Let the peoples praise you, God. Let all the people praise you. The earth has produced its harvest. God, our God, blesses us. God will bless us. And all the ends of the earth will fear him. Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you bless us. We are thankful that you have done great things that we can praise you for. We are thankful, God, that you always are watching and your face shines upon us and gives us blessing after blessing. I'm thankful that we are here today in your house to worship you. Lord, may you be pleased with our worship and may you be honored and glorified in everything that we sing and say and do this morning. And I pray, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everybody. I do have a voice this week, so that is nice. But we also, in the process, lost a projector. So I guess it's an okay trade-off. Everybody's just got to look that way or move over here. So uh, if you're a guest, we're so happy that you are with us this morning. Uh, We do have a Connect card that you can fill out to get to know us a little bit better. And we also have a mobile version that you can scan on the back of your bulletin. And also, if you are a guest, don't forget to grab a gift bag on your way out today. Uh, we are collecting for Annie Armstrong for our Easter offering. Our goal is 1500 You can designate your offering uh, specifically to that on the app, or you can uh, use the uh, little offering envelope in front of you. Uh, Answers in Genesis class is still meeting tonight, and we're getting close to the end of March already. So if you have not been able to come, uh, there is still a few weeks left for you to do that. So make sure you are in the fellowship hall at 6 o'clock for that tonight. And then also this coming Friday, we are going to Winter Jam. Uh, so, YC kids, make sure you sign up for that. So, I know if we're taking a, a little car, if we're taking a really big car. So, make sure you let me know as soon as possible. Sign up on the app for that and bring your $15 with you uh, to give at the door. I don't know, parents, what time we're getting back from it, but I assume it's late. So, uh, next Sunday is a baptism and Lord's Supper service. So, if you have not been baptized and you are interested in being baptized, please let us know uh, before March 19th so that we can have the water ready for you. Uh, also, on Wednesday, March 29th, you guys might remember Stephen Arnold. He was with us, uh, I guess, over a year ago. It's been a while. Um, but he's from Chosen People Ministries. He's going to be here at 7 o'clock uh, to share about his ministry to Jewish hikers in Brazil. And uh, we'll be collecting a love offering for him as well. So uh, kids' ministry stuff will still be happening that Wednesday. Uh, so we're going to do our stuff. Then we're going to hear him for a few minutes, and then we'll go down. So uh, it's, a, it's a full Wednesday night, so make sure you are here for that. Uh, Easter egg hunt is April 1st from 2 to 5. If you are able to help out with that, there is a welcome or a uh, sign up in the Welcome Center, and we need volunteers for both Friday night and Saturday to help set that up, and we're also collecting candy. Uh, so the collection is in the Welcome Center in the big bins of candy. So uh, fill that up so that my kids can have a fun uh, March 26th of packing candy and Easter eggs. So uh, do that. And then also, next Sunday, I need to know for sure if you plan on going to Impact. Uh, I do not necessarily need the money that day, although it's great if you can give it to me. Uh, I just need to know for sure if you are going. And right now, we have more adult leaders signed up than students, which has never been the case, I think, before in the history of Impact. So I don't know what to do with that information. So if you are interested in going, uh, but you are afraid you don't have that $150 yet as a student, I do not need that money as long as I know you are going. I'll need that by June 1st. But if you can pay by March 19th, uh, that would be great. So please let me know as soon as possible. So other than that, I'm excited this morning because we get two City of Light songs in a row. And that's 
that builds me up. So let's sing, uh, and then or let's worship together, and let's sing that. So y'all can stand with us again, please. This is a song that we learned last week. This is the day, and uh, it is the day. Let's sing together. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice as we lift his name. This is the day that the Lord has made. Come and rejoice. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Whether the sun will shine, whether the skies will Oh 
I think that song's growing on y'all. I think we like that. So um, this week I heard a great definition of what good worship is. And it's not, oh man, that was a great sermon. Or I really like that song. Or, oh, I got to see all my friends today. That's not what good worship is. I'm going to read you the definition of good worship. And as I read this, I want you to examine your hearts. And I want us to prepare. And let's have some good worship today. One Puritan defined good worship as that which enlivens our conscience by the holiness of God, feeds our minds with the truth of God, purges our imagination by the beauty of God, opens our heart to the love of God, and causes us to devote our will to the purpose of God. May we be challenged today, and may he be pleased with our worship.
Wanda must have knew who was preaching today. She's playing two city of lights and then quoting Puritans. It's, uh, <laughs> she knows what I like, I guess. So, uh, we are making our way very quickly through the upper room. We're going to be in John 15 this morning, and it is a great passage that we have. And so, uh, by way of introduction, I guess, I'll, I'll put out this story. Before Laura and I got married, we sat down and we, we made the list that quite a few couples make, and that was the, the divisions of the, the, of the chores. Uh, and, and, you know, it's going through a couple of changes as, as children have increased and laziness has improved uh, on my part, I think. Uh, but, but there's been two things that have stayed pretty much consistent through almost seven years of marriage, and that would be that uh, she would do most of the yard work, and I would do most of the cooking. And uh, before the men question me too much, I'm not asking the poor girl to go out and tear up stumps and, like, you know, push mow the whole yard or take some scissors and just, like, you know, trim the grass or whatever. You know, she enjoys yard work, right, honey? <laughs> she enjoys it, and uh, she does not like to cook. I personally don't hate it, but I don't love it, but I'll do it. Um, and so we've had that pretty consistently, and I'm bringing this up because what we're going to look at today has a lot of uh, gardening imagery in it. And if you don't really know anything about gardening like I do, then you're going to miss some of these things that are really important. And so uh, the first eight verses of John 15 are, are parabolic. And so, uh, because I didn't have a lot of gardening knowledge, I've never really been able to fully comprehend the depths of what Jesus was saying in these first few verses. But after studying this for, for a month or so, I, I've got, I think I've got enough of a spiritual green thumb to understand what Jesus is saying, and then to put that into words this, this morning. And so the emphasis of today, if you've already looked at your bulletin, you already know where we're going, is on the love of Christ. And that is such a great subject. It's that well that just never runs dry. Martin Lloyd-Jones put it like this. Whatever one may say about the love of God in Christ Jesus, there's always something more to be said. If we were to go home today, sit, bring out our laptops, bring out our computers, iPads, whatever it is, and we would just started typing and typing and typing about the vastness of God's love, the greatness of that love, the depths, the heights, the widths, whatever you want to say of God's love, we could spend an eternity before we even broke through the first page. That is the depth and the beauty of God's love. And, and I love the hymn that goes like this. Could we with ink the ocean fill and were the skies a parchment made, were every stalk on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. So we're going to dive into this love this morning, and we're going to look at it from three perspectives. Uh, we're going to spend most of our time looking at God's love for us. And then we're going to respond and see how we are to love each other, and then we're going to finish with, ultimately, that which the world loves. So I'm going to just go ahead and dive right into these verses. We'll start with the first 11. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing." If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. The Bible is not a stranger to the imagery that we've just read about. Both Testaments are, are full of, of references to vines, to, to vineyards, to fruit, to uh, you know, vine dressers. And Jesus, in his own ministry, he certainly referenced this quite a lot. Uh, but what's interesting to note is that in his teaching ministry, every time that he speaks of a vine, 
it's, unless he's referring to himself, it's never positive. If you look at, at some of the parables that, you, you, that might come to mind, you have Luke 13, you have uh, Mark 12, Matthew 21. Jesus references the unfruitfulness of the vineyard and the destruction that is brought forth by those that were in the vineyard. So, so if you were a first century man or woman, you would be very familiar with vines. You would be very familiar with vineyards. You would see them probably every day. But Jesus does not want us to be content with just any vine. Verse 1, what does he say? He says that he is the true vine and that his father is the vine dresser. Now, why is he the true vine? Why is that name important for us? And really, it comes down to the vines that were found in the Old Testament, right? So like the vine of the Old Covenant almost. In the Old Testament, the vine of God was almost always equated with the nation and people of Israel. Look at uh, Psalm 80, verses 8 through 9. You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root and filled the land. So God here, the Father, he's still the vine dresser. But who is the vine being addressed? It is Israel. Now, the issue with the Israelites, and, and you don't have to be an Old Testament or a Bible scholar to recognize this, is that they constantly fell short of what God called them to be. Right? Like, just skim through judges. It's amazing. It's just failure after failure after failure. They do okay. Failure, failure, failure. It's just constant. And why was that? Because they were not connected to the true vine. In Isaiah chapter 5, the Lord says the only thing that Israel brought forth was sour grapes. Which to us, that doesn't sound that bad. But, you know, if you're a first century person or if you're a person in the time of Isaiah, you needed those grapes. And you needed them to be productive and, and fruitful. Not <laughs> sour or wild. And then in Ezekiel 15, Jerusalem is called a vine that is useful for nothing. Nothing at all. Israel was planted as a vine, but it didn't produce anything of value. And it had great potential, but they wasted it. See, Israel was to be this nation that produced this great spiritual fruit, this place that pointed to the God who established them, but they were only a vine that produces sour fruit. Why? Because they were not connected to the true vine. Who is the true vine then? Well, we know, and Derek Kidner, he tells us that what Israel had only begun to be, Christ wholly was and is. Now, if you want to have a productive life, if you want to know God's will for your life, you need to be connected to the right vine. For Jesus to say that he is the true vine was for him to say that if we want anything of eternal significance, we need to be connected to him. We need to abide in him. And he, he expands upon this in verse 5 when he tells that apart from him, we can do nothing. Now, obviously, non-Christians are capable of doing things. And what Jesus is getting at is that if you want something to really matter, you need to be connected to him. And so, Jesus needs to be the vine. And we are to be the branches, and as I was studying this passage, as you become to look at this garden imagery, if you don't have this knowledge of what gardening is or, or vineyards or vines, you're going to kind of struggle to see some things in here. But, but after studying it, the love of Christ just, just jumps out in these 11 verses. And so the first thing that we see is that God the Father is the great vine dresser. And he prunes us so that we might bear more fruit. Now, you might think, what does this have to do with God's love for us as Christians? Well, pruning involves cleansing, right? It involves uh, removing and cutting away the, that which hinders the growth of the plant. And you might think, well, what does this have to do with the Christian life? Well, it's a reference to our sanctification. It's a reference to our growing to be more like Christ, conforming more to his image and so our Heavenly Father, He loves us so much that He purifies and He removes things from our lives that hinder our greater good. Now, pruning is not always easy because it involves cutting things off. It involves even maybe replanting, taking out of the ground, digging a new hole, putting it back in so that the branch can, or the fruit can thrive. And if you're not familiar with what a gardener is doing, then you might think, well, won't that hurt the plant? But no, that's not, all, that, that's not the case here. See, there are things that God is doing in our lives 
that on the surface may look painful, but here's the thing, it's always necessary. The author of Hebrews, he talks about this in chapter 12, and we'll get to 11 in a second, but verse 7 says, it is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? And then here in verse 11, for the moment all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, look at this imagery right here, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. God does not cut things out of our lives because he hates us. Instead, he cuts things out and disciplines us because he loves us. He removes things from our lives so that we may have a greater joy and produce a greater fruit, much greater than if we just kind of went off on our own ways. And sometimes it takes a while to see this. I remember being in college, it was probably like 10 years ago to like last month. I, I had my first real heartbreak. Poor little Brady. He, uh, he thought that he had the one. Like everything seemed perfect. Like, you know, plans were being made. I was already looking at rings for ring by spring for me because obviously she was going to propose to me. Uh, everything was going to be great. And then like that, it's gone. And, and, and looking back on it, as painful as that time was, I am thankful for that bruise. I'm thankful that, that things were cut off and removed so that I could have something that I really needed, something that was far greater. Because if he did not do that, no one, who's to say if I'd be in ministry? I certainly wouldn't have Laura. Wouldn't have two pretty all right kids, you know? <laughs> they're good. Not when they sleep, but they're good. Um, but in that moment, Pastor Brady's thinking, no, nah, this is not fun. And yet God in his mercy, who sees beginning, middle, and end, says, I know this doesn't look great, but I love you enough to not give this to you because I know what you need. And I have something better for you in the future. So how else do we see the love of God and the love of Christ in this passage? Well, we need to look at the language in these first 11 verses. Uh, Ten times in 11 verses, Christ refers to us abiding in him. See, we as Christians, we're not just with him. We are in him, and he is in us. And this is one of Paul's favorite ways of describing Christians, that we are in Christ. And this shows that Christ has this proximity to us. It shows this great permanence and intimacy of this relationship. And J.C. Ryle, he said, to abide in Christ means to keep up a habit of constant, close communion with him, to be always leaning on him, resting on him, pouring out our hearts to him and using him as our fountain of life and strength, as our chief companion and best friend. If Christ is just simply with us, then he could leave us, right? But instead, Christ abides in us and we in him. And this shows us that, that we as Christians, we cannot be separated from the love of God because if Christ is in us and we are in him and the Father loves the Son, then ultimately we're loved because we are in Christ. This is the great emphasis of verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. So abide in my love. If we just stop and meditate there, and we look at this. How has God the Father loved the Son? The love of God the Father for Christ the Son is a love that has no beginning and it has no end. It is a perfect love. It's a love that is void of distractions, of of, of other lovers. It is love that is full. It is a complete love. It's a love that can never be diminished or removed. If, if God was an old southern singer, he would probably say it was like this. I will love you forever and ever and ever. Amen. As long as old men sit and talk about the weather, and as long as old women sit and talk about old men, if you ask me how long I'll be faithful, I'll be happy to tell you again. I will love you forever and ever and ever. Then all the Randy Travises go, amen. <laughs> right? But God is not Randy Travis, and that's the other, other than Johnny Cash, that's the only country song I know. So there's this permanence to this love. Jesus is going to love you forever, and who else can say that? Who else can really love you forever? Understand this. I have some students who on Wednesday nights, on Valentine's Day, they had the love of their life, and they've had like two others since then. Like, who else is going to love you forever? Who else can love you like this but he that reigns forever? And this is the greatest love to ever exist. It's the very love that Christ says he loves us. 
So what does this mean for us? This means that his love for you does, is not based on what you bring to the table. It is not based on these strengths that you have. See, Jesus does not love you for some future version of you that doesn't exist yet. Right now, he loves you flaws and all, but obviously we don't stay with those flaws, right? He comes to us as we are, but he doesn't leave us as we are. So what does this mean? For me personally, I know that the Son of God has left heaven for me. That he came to sinful mankind in all of its dirt and grime and garbage and put on flesh and he lived a perfect life. And that as I betrayed him for silver, as I hammered the nails into his hands and feet and bashed his head with thorns, as I saw him die on the cross, he has never once stopped loving me. And as he has endured the cross, as he looked at the joy that was before him, and it was that I would abide in him and he in me. And that is how he sees every single Christian. And so we can sing the love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. So how as Christians can we question the love of our Savior? He has gone to the cross for us. He has endured death for us. And right at this very moment, he is mediating on behalf of our, uh, on our behalf to his heavenly Father. But let's just say for, for some reason it was possible for God to forget his love for you. And I'll stress it, it is not possible but let's say that it was. We have Christ as our mediator. He is, our, he is the one who goes on our behalf to the Father. Here's how this conversation would go. He would, he would go to his Father and he would say, Father, do you love me? And God would answer, of course, my son, of course I love you. And so the son would then say, well, how do you love me? And God would say, I, I love you perfectly. I love you wholly. I love you complete and full. And the son would say, Will you love, or will your love ever be separated from me? And God would say, not for a single moment will my love ever be removed from you. And then Christ would say, so is my love for these people. As you have loved me, so I love them. And as I have no limit of love for them, and you have no limit of love for me, these are mine, I am yours and I can't forget those that I have engraved on the palm of my hands. This is the love of God. If, if, if you question it as a Christian, know that you don't have to. Because he has proved it time and time again. Moment by moment is nothing but a testimony to the God who loves us. And we could dwell here forever, but we've got to keep going on. Do you know this love? This is Christ's love for you. What is your love for him? So let's look at our love, though, for each other and look at verses 12 through 17. Jesus, he's still talking. He says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. And greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide. So that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, so that you will love one another. See, we're not God's enemies anymore as Christians. We are God's friends. And God has chosen us to be his friends. And I think that's kind of worth uh, getting off the off-ramp on it and talking about for, for a second there, you know very well you can't choose your family. Flaws and all, you can't choose your family. You're stuck with them whether you like them or not. But you can choose your friends. And in a way, we, we love family, and, and I'll tiptoe around, almost out of obligation. They're blood, right? You kind of have to, almost. Even if you don't like them, there's still the sense of you should love them. But with friends, there's this conscientious effort, right, that goes in to loving them. And so what this means for us is that Jesus' love for you, it's not, it's not out of obligation, it's purposeful. It's intentional. And in the words of Proverbs 18, Christ is that friend that sticks closer to a brother. So how are we then to love one another? And Christ does not give us a, a new way to do it. He, he really just echoes what he said two weeks ago in John chapter 13, uh, that that. 
we love as he's loved us. And you might think at first, well, that's impossible. And in a way it is, because even if we are to die for our friends, our death does not atone for their sin. Right? Like, it's a, it's a great deed, but it's not an atoning death. But our love for each other should be pure, and it should be holy, and it shouldn't depend upon the worthiness of the person, but instead springs forth from the love that God has shown us. So how do we love each other? Well, the greatest way that we can is by doing what God and Christ has commanded us. That is how we love each other by doing what he's commanded us to do, because that covers a multitude of sins. So what has Jesus commanded us to do? Well, he has commanded us to love our neighbor. He's commanded us to love our enemies. He's commanded us to love our friends. He has commanded us to go and spread the gospel. He has commanded us to pursue truth and righteousness, and this is how we love one another. See, remember, it's, it's the great commandment. It's not the great suggestion, right? God tells us, go and do this as an expression of my love for you. And his commands are not a burden to us. Our love is not to be a sentimental love. It's an outgoing love. One of our favorite verses at home is 1 John 3.18. Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. See, it's one thing for a husband to say that he loves his wife. But it's another thing if he says that and then he goes and beats her. Because that's not love. I can say I love my wife. But as I'm telling her that, I'm texting somebody else and saying the very same thing. That's not love. True love talks the talk and it walks the walk. That's, you know, the old-timey version of it is right here. All right? Love goes two miles when it's only asked to go one. And our love is not a copy and paste of Christ's love for us, but it is ultimately a response towards God's love for us. You know, John also, in this very letter, he says, we love because he first loved us. See, Jesus does more than just love us in word or talk. He first loves us in deed and in truth. What's one of the very first songs that we teach our kids? You know, the old old, uh, Sunday school song, Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Yes, the Bible absolutely tells us so. But at the same time, the Bible is more than just word. Why? Because it tells us what has happened in space, time, and history. It tells us what has really and truly happened, and we see what Jesus really is and truly doing. That is a it's an active love, it's an ongoing love. It's not just some some story. You can read the love of Romeo and Juliet, but that love just dies there at the end of the page, right? But we know that the Bible is not a dead book, it's a living book that's testifying to what Jesus is already doing and has been doing and will continue to do. So, yes, Jesus is living this out. He loves in word and talk, but he also loves us in deed and truth, and we respond in 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 a holy way love towards others. God's love for us is the driving force behind our love for each other. And as we love each other, we're just doing what Christ has commanded us to do. And now we're going to kind of change gears entirely. We've seen God's love for us. We've seen how we are to love him, how we are to love each other. Now let's look at the love of the world. So we're going to two extremes here. We see the great love of God, and then we're going to see the hatred here of the world. Jesus says, if the world hates you, Know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you are the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who has sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without cause. But when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. We see the great contrast. We've just seen and read of Christ's love for us, the love that we have for each other. Let's look at the love of the world or that which the world loves. The world loves sin. The world loves itself. The world is in love with the devil. See, the world does not see Christ and his church as just a nuisance, right? The world hates 
God. They see God as their great enemy. And it is because we as the people of God love God that we are hated as well. We are not people of the world because God has called us out of the world. Paul, he, he emphasizes this in Ephesians 5, 1 through 8. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. Let there be no filthiness nor foolish talk nor crude joking which are out of place. But instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Here's the contrast. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So walk as children of light. We know that the, the world is under the prince of darkness, but we are not of this world. Christians are children of Light. We should not be surprised that the world hates the church. Why? Because the world has always hated the things of God. And the world is so deep in sin that there's no part of it that actively wants God or desires to pursue righteousness. It, apart from Christ, you are so wicked and vile. Like How much evil is in one sin that it condemns all of mankind forever? How much wickedness and vileness can be there that, that, that it would cause the Son of God to have to die to pay for it. This is no small wickedness and no small sin, no small evil. This is why we need a Savior. See, Joel Osteen, a number of years ago, he said something that was pretty stupid, and I know that's about as vague of a statement as I can make, uh, but he, he was on national television, and, and he was talking about uh, some, some trip that he took, some, some other world religions, and... Uh, uh, Larry King, I think, asked him, you've been to all these other places. Are you saying that only Christians go to heaven? And Joel Osteen, he looks him in the eyes and he says, well, I don't know. Okay. Well, why don't you know? You should know. You sit, claim to preach the gospel. And he says, I, I don't know if all these other religions, if I, like I've, I've been to India with my father. I've been to these places with my father. And I see them I see their worship, and, you know, it might be other gods, but here's the thing, I know that they love God. So I don't know if they go to heaven. I'm not in a place to see it or, or in a place to, to really say yes or no, and it's like, come on, man. You got one job. It should be clear to us that this is contrary to everything that the Bible teaches these other worshipers, they don't love God, they hate God. And we know this because they have openly rejected him that God has sent. Paul would say in Romans 3, 10 through 18, as it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave, they use their tongues to deceive, the venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery in the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. What is he saying? The world does not just tolerate God. The world hates God. No one seeks God. All have turned aside. There is no fear of God in their eyes. And this is why the seeker-sensitive model of church is just insane to me. R.C. Sproul, he used to say that if someone was truly to open up a seeker-sensitive church, the only person that would show up is God, because no one's seeking after God. No, the world doesn't seek him. The world does not love God. The world has rejected and despised the Son and has nailed him to a cross, and yet we're surprised that we as his people would be viewed negatively? All throughout history, the people of God have been despised because of their proximity to him. The world is going to hate you. If you are a Christian, they are going to hate you because they hate Christ. The world is going to persecute you because they have persecuted Christ. Like, it's, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. It's not a matter of what, it's a matter of how much. We are very fortunate to live in a country where we don't have as, as much religious persecution as, as some other places. 
But, we get, we, but I see the trajectory we're on. And we need to be ready. This is why we're talking about the second coming of Jesus on Wednesday night, so if you're not coming, you should come. Um, free, free publicity there. The world's going to persecute us. So how are we going to survive? Well, first off, we remember that this world's not our home. We're, we are sojourners. We're travelers. We're on our way to a far country, a better place, a new Jerusalem. Our country's in heaven. And while the per- world may persecute us, while it may even kill us, we know to whom we belong. And we know where we are going. And this is what we read last week in John 14. Understand this. As faithful servants of Christ, the worst thing that the world can do to you is kill you. And it expedites your, your arrival to the new Jerusalem. The worst thing that can happen is that we get to be in paradise a little bit sooner. And even that is not outside of God's sovereign hand. That doesn't sound that bad to me. The moment our lives end here, we wake up in paradise, where we behold the presence of our loving Savior forever. So what do we do until that time comes? Well, Jesus has told us we bear witness to him. We love our neighbor. We spread the gospel. And how do we do this? How do we do this great battle with with all that the world is throwing at us? Well, he tells us also that too. We go out in the spirit of truth. We go out with the helper, the Holy Spirit that God provides. And this world, we know it's lost, that it is dead in its sin. And if we're to love others the way that Christ loves us, here's what this means. We go to the highways and the byways and we show the world the love of Christ. And we point them to the light that outshines the darkness. We go with all boldness, without hindrance, and we declare the excellencies of our Savior. And we need to do this because it is through the fruit that the world will know that we are his disciples. It is through the outreach that we do as the church that the world is going to see that Christ is the true vine. And we are connected to him. We are the branches. And he has saved us for this purpose that we might bear fruit. Yes, God absolutely, really does love you. He really loves you despite your hatred of him, despite the fact you crucified his son, he loved you anyway, and he has given you the way of salvation. And he will love us to the end. Heaven and earth might pass away, but God's word and his love for us are going to endure forever. It will last forever and ever. Amen. In the words of Randy Travis again, And it comes to us as we are, but it never leaves us as we are. It comes and it abides in us. So how do we respond to the love of Christ? On one hand, you can embrace it. And I hope that you do embrace it. Every day I hope I embrace it more and more that I'm not satisfied with with just this like little, uh, you know, crumb of it. But like Jacob wrestling with, with God, I will not let go until you bless me. I hope that is your mindset that you don't let go of God's love, that you want more and more. And so obviously, if you want more and more love of God, it's not going to be enough for you to only spend time with him between 11 and 12 on Sunday, right? Maybe the reason God does not seem so close to you is because you are not really close to him. If I only spent one hour a week with Laura, she probably would hate that. Maybe she'd like it, I don't know. It's hard to say. If you're only spending the bare minimum... You're not going to grow in that love. You're not going to see the heights and the depths and the the widths of God's love for you. Are you spending time with him? Have you embraced his love? Is this love going to drive you in all that you do? I do not want to go and reach the nations with the gospel if I did not know that God is going to be with me as I do it. I need that. We need that as the church to know that God loves us so much that he does not leave us as orphans. Are you going to keep this love to yourself and so what do we say to all of these things? Well, if God is for us, then who can be against us? Right? In all these things, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. So that now neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor things that be, nor things that were, nor things that are, nor powers, heights, depth, nothing else in all of creation is going to be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. This is the only love that's going to last forever. This is the only love that we're ever going to really need. So what are you going to do with the love that is being shown to you? Maybe that does mean baptism. 
Maybe that does mean fully embracing Christ in faith and in love and, 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 and pouring out your heart and soul to him, knowing that he's not going to turn away anyone that comes to him. But the stupid thing would be to hear of this great love for you and do nothing with it. So my prayer is that you would do something with it. We know the world's broken. I don't watch the news anymore because what's the point? I mean, we, we've not going like to get any better. So what are we going to do? We know the one that's making all things new. But until that day comes, we cannot hide from the world but point it to the truth. And we know that he's coming soon, and there's still a lot of work to be done. So have you been made right with him? Have you embraced the love that he has shown you? Or are you just going to ignore it? I pray that you don't. And as we reflect on this time, just really take the moment. Look at the heights, look at the depths of God's love for you. Nothing has stopped it and nothing ever will. So what are you going to do with that love? So let's pray. Lord Jesus, we know that we have been purchased with a price, that you have loved us from before time began, and that despite our flaws, you don't leave us as we are, but you love us as we are to change us. So I just pray as we reflect and bask on that love that we don't ever for a moment belittle it or think it as, as this small thing, but recognize God really does and truly love us forever and ever. Amen. So Lord Jesus, we thank you for this, and it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Stand with us as we reflect on what our pastor just shared with us. Um, this is your time to respond. The one who made the heavens made my heart and soul Before I drew a breath, I was loved and known I am his creation, the maker's master i
about a, uh, someone in our church. If you know Melanie and Kevin Wright, Kevin Wright owns River Ridge Auto and their son Cody Wright has been a race car driver and a go-kart driver since he's about five years old. And so uh, he had a whole season last year and they're starting another one soon. And so April 1st at two o'clock, they are having uh, a fundraiser for him at River Ridge Auto for his racing team. But also if you want uh, some pre-order Brunswick stew or some Boston butts, please let Melanie know and she will uh, get those for you and you can uh, eat that delicious food. So I want to let you, and she wanted me to let you know that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for your love. Uh, without it, Lord, we have nothing. And Lord, we are, have been commanded by you to love one another. Also to even love our enemies who hate us because of our love for you and our walk with you. I pray therefore, Lord, that in this week, uh, everyone would see us and know that we are your follower because of our love. I pray, Lord, that uh, your love uh, would be displayed in our actions and in our words. And that, Lord, we would have people glorify your name because of how we live our life this week. Lord Jesus, I pray all these things as we leave with your blessing of mercy, love, and grace. In your name, amen.